Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. Don't worry about my life because it ain't for you. And Dale Hummel. Today, I shall behave as if this is the day I will be remembered. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel alongside co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Ryan, we're, we're back again. Stop. <laughs> I know you always get to talk first, but I'm going to talk first because I have a few things I need to address. So. Wait, uh, t- time out, time out. Is this, is this political, personal? What, what is it? It's a whole lot of stuff. Okay. And so you're just going to have to sit back and like, whatever, just chill for a minute. It's kind of an Elsa moment, maybe. For you. No, this is not me letting it go. This is just letting my opinion out there. So I understand that in like the first three episodes of the new year, we've probably ruffled some people's feathers and we've talked about stuff that's controversial and taboo and all this other stuff. And that's like, that's fine. That's what we came to do. We came to be transparent. We came to talk about stuff that nobody else will talk about. And I'm good with people being critical and because A, number one, I'm fine with constructive criticism. B, number two, I am unoffendable. At this point. So now when I when I try to give you constructive criticism, it, it never seems to go well. Dale, we're not talking about you right now. We're talking about <laughs> the people that listen to the podcast. Got Here it. is my problem. There are two people on this podcast. There is me and there is Dale. Why doesn't Dale get any hate mail? Why don't y'all send him <laughs> nasty shit? Why don't y'all talk about him on the internet? Nobody does. It's all the gay. This is I discrimination. Can, I can answer that. It is discrimination. discrimination. Yeah, didn't Biden sign something? We, so they could go to jail over this now. Oh, that's right. I think it's absolute gender somehow specific discrimination. Yeah, I am no, the white I'm a privileged. Man. I may wear fine. makeup and like light guys, but I'm definitely a man. I just want everybody to clarify that. I know I'm there's, a guy. There's no question in your mind. <laughs> there's no you do question. A DNA test I don't want to be a woman. <laughs> I'm just saying. I know I'm a guy. but. <laughs> I want to know why none of you people talk shit about Dale. It's all the game. Do you think it's because I come across a little easier, a little more logical, not quite as opinionated? Logical? You're the logical one. Oh, dear Lord. If they (laughs) believe that, then yeah, sure, go with that. But anyway. We're going to go with that. I I, I like the discrimination one. I I personally want to go with that one. Yeah, well, whatever it is, y'all need to like hate on Dale because he has opinions too and he talks about them on here. So send him a few hate emails, messages, texts, snaps, whatever. Next. Uh, maybe maybe they come in. I just I don't I don't I'm not very good on Snap and I'm not very I, I don't <sighs> retrieve much of my social media messages. Okay. Next. So last week's episode on county fairs, like one of the biggest episodes we've ever had, and I know it would be because again, like it affects everybody in our industry, and that's great. I need to clarify a couple of things. I never said that all people that run county fairs are terrible, awful people that cheat, lie, and steal. That never came out of my mouth. Okay? That I, never... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back you up here. You, you did not say that. That did not happen. Nor did and I. Again, your opinion doesn't matter because nobody sends you hate mail. They don't listen to you, <laughs> evidently. <laughs> but um, Dale didn't either. I never said that. We talked about the mentality around county fairs, how we thought they could be better, all this other stuff. I know lots of people that run county fairs and jackpot shows and big shows that they are honest, trustworthy people that are there for all the kids, including their own. So I, and again, I only said that in, there was only like two county fairs I've ever judged that the experience was so bad that I wished I hadn't done that. So I don't know where y'all coming up with all this that, I labeled everybody involved with the county fair as like Satan, but that was not right. And (laughs) finally, I did not say that county fairs were needed to be wiped out of existence or anything. I did state, and I will say again, all of the county fairs that I have gone to as a participant, as a helper, as a supporter, they have not been very fun for me. Now, that's all I said. But, of course, 
When I show up at Tech County Fair, people know that I came to try to win the show. So the masses aren't going to be real happy unless I'm on their team. So they're probably not going to be fun for me. Okay. I got that off my chest. Are you done? I'm done. Are you done? Yep, done. Just wanted to clear that up. And I thought, I want to make it clear that you said you were okay with the constructive criticism. I am. Hate mail's different. Oh, got it. Got and again, it. And I, I, and I if will you're going to you hate did, on you'd... me, be more creative about it because there have been people <laughs> been doing this my whole life. Y'all got to come up with some new material. Next. I'm going to take another positive approach to this, and, and I, I didn't I see I thought that was positive. Mail. I, I'm I challenging it. the people to like come up with new <laughs> criticisms of me. That is being positive. I'm offering I saw challenges. a few things that that was shared and they said you can skip the current events if you don't like the political side or the covid side and and that's that's fine that that works too i kind of like that part of it well i think a bunch of people that have never listened to the podcast listened last week and so they probably don't know that we do current events each time and that's fine and since there were like four to five people that said that they could do without that for you people we're not getting rid of current events (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of important to us. It's it's, it's a we think it's really just... important, and we think that like it needs to be out there, and like people need to know what's going on in the world. But we will make it easier for you to skip by it, and there will be a timestamp on the deals now that you can skip straight to the topic. So again, me helping you, but we're not getting rid of current <laughs> events. Speaking of current events, lead us off. Where where would you like to talk about in the world right now? I am trying my best to keep an open mind about President Biden. I no, am. I, I, I have to stop you. I, you. You can't go down this path. Why? Because he's already enacted how many executive orders and made enough statements. You don't ever let me finish my thoughts. This is oh, why nobody sends I you remember, email. I remember your thoughts from last week or the week before, and you're going to give him a chance. You're going to give him your chance. He's your president. It's been a little bit since he's been in office. I was giving him a chance. I'm still trying to give him a chance. He is I'm not, making it I damn am, hard. I'm just I am telling not. You. I, there is, I, I, I'm not. I'm done. He's done. making it done. really done. difficult. Done. Okay, finish. I apologize for interrupting. He is making it really difficult on me. You know, he stopped the pipeline. He's got Canada suing us. How does Canada? Canada is the closest to Switzerland as anything, and they're already suing us. He hadn't been in office all week. With all of his executive orders and his stopping the pipeline and all this other, he's put so many people out of work. Ladies, I put something up on my Facebook that offended some of y'all, and that's okay. But the truth is 57% of women voted for Biden. Therefore, that's how he got elected. And I'm not saying that as any of the women in the livestock industry, I'm not like honing you out as you voted for Biden. You're the reason this happened. I'm saying women, that gender in general, 57% of them voted for him. That is why he got elected. So one of the first things he does is guess what, Dale? There are no more genders. Gone. Mm -hmm. No. So we actually don't have the first woman vice president because there are no genders. And, and you guys might think Ryan's being um, exaggerating here, that this is real. I'm not. And, and I get to the point where it appears as though a male can play on the female sports teams if they yes. want to push the envelope. Absolutely. Go into whatever bathroom you want to go into. Which I still don't understand this because they say if – a male identifies as a female, then he can play on a female sports team. But Biden erased all genders, so then again, why isn't there just one team? Can somebody answer me that? It's very difficult. Very, very difficult. I'm just saying. <laughs> Do you know U.S. citizens are, are waiting a, a stimulus check that was pushed off for political reasons? He gave $4 to billion to somebody else today. That would be Central America. There you he go. Promised, he promised the Mexican president he would give $4 billion to Central America, and we have restaurant owners and other small businesses closing their doors left and right. No, it, it's amazing to Central me. Central America we, gets $4 billion. Americans still don't have a stimulus check. What he promised would happen like as soon as he got, like, wasn't that going to be an executive order? And do you want me to tell you about the stimulus check? What's, what's Which gonna, I know he has to have Congress to approve it, but he's never even wrote the executive order to get Congress's backing on the stimulus is my point. But anyway. Yes. I mean, there, I, I listened to the press conference today, and some, some facts came up prior to and after. The homeless in San Francisco, they're spending millions in hotel bills each month. 
And he's going to make the do- taxpayers pay for that. All of us. Exactly. Do you want to know who's going to bail? You want to know who's going to bail out California, Illinois, and New York? The states that are crooked, reckless, political waste, corruption, all with a state bailout, a federal bailout from all the other taxpayers across the country are going to bail these states out, including the state of Illinois. My state retirement system is based on all of this, and it's it's very much in question. If there's not a bailout, what do I get? I don't care. Because this this is wrong. It's just like the rest of the state of Illinois paying for mass transit and other public services in Chicago, bleeding the rest of the state dry. Why would we allow these three states to pull from the other taxpayers when they've been fiscally irresponsible, corrupt, everything you can you want to talk about? It's terrible. That's going to hold up the bill for the stimulus because they're going to insert those things in there that, that should not be there. I don't know when it'll get passed. I, I'm really... Confused because the Democrats say that they want unity, right? Okay, none of this is unifying anybody. But in their latest move to unify the country, they not only voted to impeach him, but they have sent the articles of impeachment to the Senate. And now, Dale, do you know that there's a loophole in impeachment for non-presidents, which Trump has not even been a non-president for a week, But non-presidents, you don't have to have the chief of justice, which is now John Roberts, you know, be over the trial. So guess who gets to be over the trial of the second impeachment of Donald Trump? I was totally unaware of this, but I'm going to I'm going to throw out Schumer or Pelosi. No, the oldest, longest serving person of the party that is in control of the Senate. That is Patrick Leahy. Great. I was unaware of this. He is the one that is going to serve as oversee this. That's going to be super fair. <laughs> That's not going to go well at I all. I mean, super fair. And, and, and the whole thing about it is this move has done nothing for them because, like, there were a few Republicans that were like, I don't know. I'm on the fence. That move completely knocked them back in Trump's court because it's bullshit. And so now he's not going to get impeached. No, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I've got two topics we got to squeeze in quickly because I, I think they're important and I would like your input on it. Okay. The first one, I saw some numbers today that Facebook followed by Amazon each put over $17 million into the pockets of lobbyists. Combine this with restricting conservative views directly on Facebook and then Amazon taking down Parler. They have everything in place to control Congress and avoid being broken up over monopoly issues. To me, this is the biggest single threat to conservatives ever regaining power in any of the branches of federal government. When they can restrict that much and not allow that conservative opinion out there, I I don't know what's going to happen, right? I don't know that people are taking this quite as serious, and I'm fearful because prior to them going very strong to the left and restricting conservative views, even some of the Democrats were concerned about the monopoly status and they had too much control. But I'm fearful now because they're so strongly promoting the liberal left that those Democrats may not want to break them up or restrict them or control them or try to make it an even playing field in terms of freedom of speech. All of this is just a gigantic mess. And again, like... like the whole big tech, social media, all of that stuff, like, I, I'm i very active on all of it, and I can deal without it. I mean, again, I would be upset about Snapchat, but the rest of it I can deal with that. But, like, I don't know, because of the way that Democrats have control of everything, and it's working in their favor, I don't see anything happening to stop this or to make it better. Like, I, I, I don't know. There's not an answer, I guess, is what I'm saying. I, I, don't, I don't see the solution either, unless some of the Democrats step up and decide, okay, we're, we're going to put some regulations in place or we're going to allow, pull out whatever provision they have that they can't be sued, um, take that off the table, and that, that straightens things up pretty quickly. So I, I don't know either. The other one, you're not going to like my, my final thing here in current events very much. Mm-hmm. And and you and I discussed this very briefly. I am deeply concerned. And we can use the Keystone Pipeline being shut down. We can 
referenced the fact that there will be no more exploration or drilling on federal land, even though there are leases in place that are probably, they say they're looking at those leases. What that means to me is they're going to terminate those leases and private oil cannot get in and, and harvest any resources off of federal ground, even though they may have a 5, 10, 20-year lease. What I, I don't know what the length of the, those leases are, but they are still current. I am fearful they're going to pull them away. When we start doing all these things, what has already happened to, to gasoline prices? Well, they've started to go. Or I, I don't know. I'm assuming that well, I see a lot on social media that everybody thinks gas prices are going up. Whether they have yet or not, they're afraid that they're going to go way up. The perception, and they have gone up some, and, and I'm not even as worried about that. I understand that a lot of people out there do get very concerned about the fuel prices, and I, and I would prefer they were a little lesser. It but I'm far anywhere more, anyway. We're in lockdown. <laughs> okay, I'm far more concerned about something else, and I I am going to state my age here a little bit or date myself a little bit. But I remember all too well when we were so dependent on the Middle East for oil, Russia, and Venezuela. And if we have to return to those days, which we are going to at this rate, that is not a good place to be. That's part of what happened in Desert Storm. We spent more efforts and finances and headaches trying to keep the Middle East in check so we could get oil out of there. It was, it was crazy. We have become energy independent. And I'm not saying that we don't need to move to cleaner energy. Um, fossil fuels are not going to last forever. But we better be realistic about this. We can't flip a switch and change overnight. That oil that was going to come down from Canada in that pipeline that was very clean and very efficient, it's going to come down in trucks that aren't as clean, that aren't as efficient. It's still going to move from point A to B, but not as efficiently as it could have with the pipeline. The drilling and exploration on, on feral lands, that's going to decrease our energy independence dramatically. If we could implement some common sense and say, let's continue this, I think we're 10 to 20 years before we can be on what we consider true green energy. And I don't know that we can ever go completely that way without more nuclear power plants. And we are the only country out there that hasn't continued to build nuclear power plants. I don't necessarily want to live next to a nuclear power plant, but I promise you we, we've got plants in this country that are getting pretty old. And the new technology and methods of engineering and building those now I feel very comfortable that they'd be much safer than they were when we built them long ago. And in all reality, that is the only way to put out a clean energy supply more rapidly. I, I don't see any other answer. So without that, we need to slowly transfer from our fossil fuels into some of these other areas. But it cannot happen overnight. And we're, we're going into a situation that everything Trump did for energy independence is turned around and going backwards. I don't think there's a, a solution. I, there is a solution, but the Democrats aren't going to like use that solution because so much of their party and so much of their platform is like ending fracking, you know, the Green New Deal, all this stuff, climate change, all this other stuff, which I'm not saying is not important and doesn't need to be, you know, looked at and worked on and all that other stuff. But everything's got to kind of be in moderation. It's like you said, you can't just like flip a switch and like. Boom! Hoop. Here we are. No, it's just not going to work that way. And but they don't see it that way, and so it's going to be a bumpy ride as far as that goes. And again, the one other little thing that I want to bring up, I think it is really weird that so Ohio was supposed to get out of lockdown on the twenty third. Governor extended it in like and didn't give a projection date on when. Because, like, they have a 10 p.m. curfew right now. Did not even give a projection date of when. Guess what happened in California? They're out of lockdown now. <laughs> they are. That was not going well. So, like. And, and it may have something to do with 1. million signatures on the Governor Newsom recall. Yeah. I believe so they I only think need 1.5, and he's at 1.2. Yeah, it's probably not going to look very well for him. But. I, I think that's interesting that like some of them are like still going, nope, we are going to keep you locked down. And then like California, which I mean, New York and California kind of like two biggest liberal states. And they're like, I give uh, up. Slide, slide I quit. Illinois in there, put Illinois in. It's okay. And they're a nice second runner up, but <laughs> I'm like I give up. So, but anyway. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for the main topic today? 
Oh, sure. I think this is good. It, it kind of follows in check, and, and we can kind of spin off of our county fair mentality and some things maybe that, that should change at some of the county fairs. Today, or this week, the customer is always correct. What exhibitors and parents want from a show, from jackpots to majors? But here's the problem. We're the only industry that doesn't follow this method <laughs> but of I, logic. Would, it is. But guess what? I believe COVID, if we're going to try to say something positive, with all the replacement shows, whether it's state fairs or jackpots or county shows, with everything that's taken place over the past year, I believe it's created a situation for competition. And no, to there me, is. that's perfect. I love it. it it's going to give us choices. No, when we have no choices, doubt there's more competition. But So the, I, the shows are going to have to work. To, to bring those families in because there are choices. It's going the right direction. No, I'm not saying that. I, I still think they've all got a long way to go. I'm going to be real honest. But like, I want to give a shout this- out to Cowgirls in Cowtown in my home state since Fort Worth shut down. The Buzzard family and the Boatwright family, they came together and they put on an event this past weekend in Fort Worth. They had 1,140 head from 14, 13 or 14 states. I wasn't there. I don't know. But I heard nothing but positive things about it. it. Was a huge event and went off without any, you know, drama or anything like that. And so again, just like you said about competition, when you have eleven hundred and forty head at a show the first time, that show's probably not going to go away. Now, I mean, I don't know what they're thinking. I haven't talked to any of them, but. That's really, and that's like the Cattlemen's Congress. I don't know how many they have, but they had a ton. Like, I think numbers were over 5,000. Don't think. I think, I think, I think considerably higher than that even. It was, it was crazy. I don't think that thing's going to go away. And then these shows that have been put off, like Denver and Fort Worth and stuff like that, they're obviously itching to come back. Well, when they come back, they are going to be in a new and different situation because there are going to be shows that are probably going to be there, and now people are going to have choices where there were, never were any choices before. And so, like, like this Cowgirls in Cowtown or whatever, like, for cattle exhibitors other than Texas and Oklahoma, after Denver, for as far as a junior show, if you don't live in Texas, Oklahoma, you're pretty much done. This Cowgirls in Cowtown, it had 13, 14 states. So if they go again after Denver, or you could do both, then that gives another outlet for all the other states that don't have another show after Denver to show again. So again, lots. it's going to be really interesting coming up. No, and, and think about throwing Oklahoma City in there as well. And I'm going to use a couple as, as examples here in a second. But in the past, for some reason, we thought that a new show could not start up and succeed a, competing with a state fair or a national show. We know different at this point. Look at the successful startups and replacement shows. The tradition and thought of trying to have a show compete with the state fair was not something that many would even consider. You just didn't think you could, it could happen. Now look at, I'm going to use two examples, the California Youth Expo and I believe it's the Arkansas Youth Expo, both huge successes. And you know what? They were far more well-received than those state fairs. And again, I'm not trying to, to be negative on the state fairs. Hopefully they come back and they make some changes and make it more user-friendly. But those in charge of those state fairs, whether it's on the extension side or management level within the state fair, they need to adapt and do what families want them to do to make those shows more user-friendly. And we talked about some of those things from the county fair standpoint. We're going to talk about some of those things today. And I'll tell you what, when you have these youth expos popping up, that in theory are in competition with certain state fairs, those state fairs may have existed for a long time. And I'm not afraid to to throw it out there. Illinois State Fair, I love it. I think it's got a history, a tradition. I mean, it's special to my kids. It's special to me. But I'll tell you what, there's been things in place there that we brought up last time about reways and no practice scales, things that just do not make sense. And they've got to open their minds up and start doing things differently or guess what? I think it's going to continue to dwindle, and something's going to take its place. And that's the beauty of competition. We're going to have choices. When we have choices, those shows have to do a better job accommodating their customer. You know, talking about what 
do exhibitors and families want out of shows? I I think the big picture is transparency. And that sounds real simple, but it's not so much. I, I think that that is one of those things that they they want to understand what's happening, why it's happening. And then it, when you put things out there in terms of a payback or class breaks in terms of ages, stuff like that, once you put that out into the universe, you got to follow through with that because then I understand that things happen and things have to be changed. But when you change stuff and you don't explain exactly the reason why it got changed, well, it just had to happen, then people start questioning you. And so I think being transparent is one of those things that even though like that may not come out of a parent or an exhibitor's mouth, every time I talk to people, all of their concerns or criticisms about different shows, it all leads back, I think, to the bigger picture being transparency. Because without transparency, as you mentioned last time, like not announcing the judge's name, it's sketchy. Gee, whether it is intended that way or not, probably not. But lack of transparency makes people question things and they often take a negative outlook towards it. And I never thought about it, Ryan, but you're right. When the, these shows make some changes or, or do different things and they're not transparent as to why, and I, I don't, sometimes I don't think it's intentional, it's just tradition, and they just make those choices and they, they go with it. But I think if we would make an effort from the show standpoint or show management standpoint to be more transparent, I think that the exhibitors are going to be far more accepting in, in understanding of, of the different regulations or changes or whatever may be taking place or they want to take place. I'm not saying that. Things don't happen where shows have to make changes. Some things are going to be out of their control. Like during Rona Health Department, like I'm judging a show in Michigan this weekend. It was supposed to be one place. Health Department told them no. So now they are having it at at a horse facility, privately owned horse facility, which it's not going to be ideal because not as much wash rice, can't stall inside the bar, whatever, you know, all this other stuff. But, like, when they say, they said, hey, we can't show here. This is the only place we can show. So those people have been, they understand. Some of them may not come. I, I don't blame them. But you know why it happened. When, let, let's take, for example, and I'm just making up a scenario here. Say that you put in print that you're going to pay this much, this much, and this much. And one of your sponsors that you were counting on to make that payback work doesn't come through. Well, for whatever reason, you have to go and adjust that payback. Well, you don't want to tell the public, well, the reason we're not giving as much money is because our sponsor XYZ didn't pony up. And I get that. But you also don't have to call them out by name. You can just say, look, I'm just going to be as honest with you as I can. We had this number of dollars from a sponsor. They said they were going to give it to us. They haven't. So therefore, we have to adjust our pay schedule. And I'm not saying that they're going to be overwhelmingly happy, but at least they'll know. They won't think you're trying to pocket funds or something no, like that, that. that. That makes perfect sense. I, I agree completely with that. And I think that's a good point. And there are sponsors that do that. I mean, things happen. It happens. Yeah. Yep. I'm and, not and, blaming and them. The, I mean, we, I'm just saying things happen and you have to like make adjustments, but you got to be as honest and transparent as possible about all things. Or again, we, we are a society that instead of, you know, just, Going, oh, well, I understand. We're like, what are you doing, you sketchy? Mm -mm 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 -mm." (laughs) And so that's out there. That's part of it. And I don't expect the show when a sponsor backs out like that. You can't, those shows can't lose a pile of money to put on the show and keep the prize money where it's at. I, I, I get that. And I think everybody would accept that if they just come out and say, hey, this happened. I apologize. We thought it was going to work this way, but it's different. I, I want to lead into another 
portion here, and I want to use a couple examples, and I'm, I'm probably going to sway it a little more towards the sheep and goat side because that's where my involvement is is more heavily at the moment. But I think the exhibitors want an even playing field. And you can take that so many directions from a judge that is qualified and non-political to different rules that are in place that may or may not be enforced. And I think if we look at that, let's let's start on the rules portion of it. And, and we know Ryan, Ryan, state one more time what's your what's your one rule? All one shows rule. start at noon. <laughs> okay, so all I'm shows take start it. at noon. Only rule there needs to be people. And, that is it. And that one that one would be easy to enforce. That is not reality. I can even take ten. Like ten all is right. fine, okay. but I would prefer noon. But like a lot of people aren't as fast at judging as I am. So 10's fine too. I can handle 10, but th- that's the only rule. Okay. If there are rules in place, I, I strongly recommend they enforce those rules. Dale likes and rules. No, I don't. I'm not saying that we need some rules and I don't even agree with some of them. But I want to point out that when those rules are in place and they're not enforced, those that don't adhere to the rules are getting a huge advantage. I'm going to use an example. And I'm going to make it a positive side. I want to point out that that this year in the Market Goat Show, both at the American Royal and the North American, for the first time, the no fake leg hair rule was enforced. Again, I don't care if the, there is a rule for no fake leg hair or is not, but I want to point out the fact that it's not a level playing field when you have the rule in there. Exhibitors abide by it for fear that they're going to get kicked out if they put fake leg hair on, but some of them ignore the rule, get through the show, do well, whatever. It's a huge advantage for those that break the rules than those that are abiding by the rules. So if it's in place, let's enforce it. If it's not a good rule, just take it out. And I can go either direction with that. But if we do have that fake leg hair rule in place, we need to enforce it. Both of those shows enforced it this year. It was a much more even playing field because of it. And I had a lot of people compliment those shows and and discuss with me they really appreciate that that it's all the same and again i could say put the fake leg hair on but let everybody do it don't make it a rule so only those that are willing to push the limits are are going to be in that that situation so to me it's 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 something we need to take a closer look at what rules you want in place and i think less is better to a certain degree but we also have to stop and, and think about trying to keep this very youth minded and youth friendly and keep things within check because our competitive nature some of us are going to push much further from an ethical standpoint maybe than where we should there's one more rule that's out there and this i believe is in the sheep and goats i believe right now the american royals the only national show that still has a, the teeth rule in place and I suspect that's that's going to get looked at and possibly changed. I'm not sure. And, and again, it, they can have it one way or the other. They they did enforce that rule this year, and it, and it hit quite a few people. The problem is this: just using this one as an example, some of the rules that we put in place are very difficult to properly implement. Think about some of those people that can manipulate those yearling teeth. It's it's just about impossible if somebody wants to get around that rule. For the most part, if they're willing to take a, a path that's maybe not a complete honest route, they can get around it. So now in, in this situation, either the, the exhibitor is going to gonna grind the teeth down or do whatever they have to to get in, or they're going to stay at home. So again, difficult to, to implement those rules. And there's a lot of them like it. I'm just using that one as an example that it makes it difficult. And, and that leans more towards Ryan, let's let's just have every show start at noon. That's the only rule. And, and sometimes we're we're better off. Less is better, especially if they're rules that that are just about impossible to implement. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, and again, I mean, you took very specific instances that hit home to you, and that's fine. But like, yeah, yes, I did, and I and I apologize for that. But those are the best examples that I can come up with. Heard ya. Got your point there, Dale. <laughs> See, y'all say he doesn't have opinions, so y'all hit oh, send him I, email I next week. But um, I think the thing is, and the reason that I I jokingly say that there should only be one rule and that show should start at noon is is because of what you're saying. I've been to a million shows. Okay, maybe not a million, but a whole, whole lot. And more than any other person I've been to. And I have yet to attend a show 
Not not a I, I can tell you I have not been to a single show ever that has been able to enforce every single rule that they have in their rule book. And people aren't gonna want to hear that, but that's just the truth. And, and, and it's very simple. If if they can't enforce it, it then why have be it? there. Yep, because we, we're on the same page. Because again, when and and there's a ton of reasons why they can't afford it. Depending on the show size, uh, you know, it makes it the more exhibitors, the more people, the more animals. It makes it harder to do. Uh, whether we want to admit it or not, there's very few shows that are going to have people out there twenty four seven during that show to enforce those rules. And I, I'm telling you. You have no idea the number of people that show up at show barns across America after midnight. I'm telling you, I know. I have watched it. I've been there guarding animals. I see it. And so, again, that's why I say that I have never been to a show where they can enforce all the rules. And therefore, I think since I know that that is very hard to happen, Probably if we stuck to the big things like drug testing and, you know, if you're going to put a way back or tooth rule or a fitting rule, like no fake hair, stick to those things because those are easier to enforce. Because the things that, and again, not saying completely, but there at least can be an effort made to enforce those things. Like, Anything that when you go through check-in, you can, whatever species it is, those things can be checked while that animal goes through check-in. That's something that can be enforced. Like you're talking about that tooth rule. Even though people are going to do things to get around it and they may or may not get caught, by and large, it's going to work. And there was an effort put into every single animal and exhibitor to make that rule be enforced. Do you understand what I'm saying, Dale? Yeah, absolutely. As long as there's somebody there that's qualified to do it, and sometimes that's that's a challenge. Or the same person doing it, because from one person to another, some are going to be lenient, some aren't. And I think every exhibitor is happy as long as those rules are what Ryan's talking about, enforceable and consistent across the, there. And, and I'm I'm all in on the drug testing. I'm all in on a lot of things that keep it within an ethical practice. But we we've got to be very careful on on rules that can't be enforced because it's 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 going to punish those that are actually following them. But like, and you used an example, and I I'm going to use one for the cattle people, especially Texas cattle people. Uh, Fort Worth Stock Show is our only haired steer event. It's a full fit event, and so is the heifer show. Technically, there is a rule in there that says if you are not a parent, a exhibitor, or a county agent, or an act teacher then you're not allowed to fit that animal. And I love Fort Worth, and I'm not hating on Fort Worth at all. But I know lots of years where sometimes on some days, those rules were put in place and people got ripped off, fitting, and like taken off cattle that they were fitting because they didn't fit that criteria. And yet the next dial over, somebody's doing it the same thing, just as illegal as the guys they're pulling off that heifer or steer, and he's getting away with it. Now, how do, how do you justify that? That that's the perfect example. That that's a rule that is darn near impossible to have the manpower and the knowledge of who is and isn't supposed to be on those animals to enforce. Just and about I, impossible. And again, the, normally the ones that are getting, you know, turned in or so. There are people that have beat people a lot of times, or they're, you know, got somebody out after them, all this other stuff. But again, so this kid right here on aisle A, the fitter, feeder, broker, whatever, gets told, okay, you pick up your clippers. You can't fit here. If we catch you again, you're off the grounds. But the next aisle over, the same stuff's happening, and that group and family, nothing happens. I have problems with that. And so that and so that's why I say if you can't if there's not like at least a high probability when I mean high like a 90% probability 
that you can enforce that rule for all, then I don't think you should have it because it, it's not fair. And rules are, no, rules are put in to make competition more fair, and literally what that one's doing is making it less fair. All of them that can't be enforced make it less fair. Yeah. Every rule that is put in place, it can't be enforced. Now, I want to back up because Fort Worth and Kansas, all the shows, I believe the rules are put there with good intentions for the most part. I didn't I'm, say I'm that. Give them and that I'm credit. not bashing anybody. No. I'm, we're just talking about things. Yeah. We're just, I, I think the good intentions are there, but the practicality and implication of enforcing such rules are impossible. So we've got to take a step back and let's, as show committees, as as show managers, let's look at our rules and just go through them one at a time. Can we really implement and enforce these? Is it going to be an even playing field? Are there going to be some that are breaking the rules and some that are not that we really can't enforce? We've got to stop and think. We need to adapt that rule, get rid of that rule. If there's one thing that I, I can leave everybody with from this episode, if a rule cannot be implemented effectively, We've really got to got to think about not having it. And, and I mean, it's just forced effectively, logic. then it doesn't need yes, to be implemented. Yes, yeah, a forced forced effectively. So I mean, that that seems simple, and and I I think the intentions are good. I, I like the idea of the exhibitors fitting or their county agent. I, I'm okay with that. I'm I'm okay with any of it, but hey, we do I have to too. make it. I'm just make saying, y'all ain't going to see me with a pair of clippers or glue. I, I mean, I'm just saying, and this is not something that, that I am griping about per se, but <laughs> I also like, because it's not going to affect me, but like, I, I, under, I hear the, I hear the other side of that story when it happens to somebody and yet then they can point to somebody in that barn and say, yeah, but they got to do it. So why is my oh, kid it, getting punished and they aren't? Every time a rule like that's enforced, there, there's going to be as many people that are breaking the rule that, that it doesn't have a conflict with, they, they don't get caught or they, they aren't implicated by breaking the rule. It just, it's just what it is. There's, I mean, you'd have to have such a knowledgeable, experienced staff that knows all the exhibitors, knows all the fitters. It just, it's just impossible. Let's, let's circle around just a little bit in, into the competition. I'm probably going to use too many shows as direct examples, and I'm not trying to be negative or promote one show over another. I just want to be very transparent and state some of the facts. And I think if if I use uh, the example this year that we have because of replacement shows popping up, right now we're seeing a lot on social media from the National Western. I think there's pressure or there's some concern that the National Western won't come back as strong because Oklahoma City went over so well, the Kaplan's Congress. So if I'm going to use Oklahoma City as an example, many cattle breeders that were there talked about how much more convenient it was than the National Western from a parking standpoint, from a permit standpoint, um, from an access to the grounds, hotel accessibility, lots of different things they appreciated. Now, at the same time, we need to let everybody know that Denver's gone through tremendous renovation, a complete overhaul, and it looks like parking and facilities are no longer going to be an issue. I personally love the tradition at Denver. I'm sad to see the old stockyards gone. But I love the mountains in the backdrop. I, I truly hope that there's room for both an Oklahoma City and a Denver. I know they're going to be either on top of each other time-wise or relatively close, along with possibly other shows that, that Ryan's already brought up. But I, I do believe the more the better, and I can assure you already, because Oklahoma City took place and wildly successful for taking on that big of an event and pulling it off the first year, I'm sure that Denver feels pressure and they're nervous. And, and that's part of competition. And that's a good thing. I don't want either show to go away. In an ideal world, you'd have both shows and could attend both. Worst case scenario, breeders, exhibitors, families, show families are going to make a decision. Do I want to go to Oklahoma City or do I want to go to the National Western? Let's hope they can go to both. But if they have to make a decision, they're going to vote with whichever show is more user-friendly. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And when we talk about that exhibitor, that is your vote by which show you decide to attend and which ones you decide not to go to. And up until this year, because of COVID and because of show cancellations and other popping up, the exhibitor really didn't have a vote, Ryan, for the most part, because there's only X amount of, of national shows. There's only your state fair and your state that everybody gets to go to. But that, that world has changed. 
and that's wonderful because that fits exactly what we're talking about where the exhibitors, the parents, the show families, whatever you want to call them, they now have a vote and they can decide, okay, I'm going to go the one that best fits me. All right. And, you know, you're talking about being exhibitor friendly and I mean, with technology and all this stuff now, a lot of these shows, especially because of COVID, are going to things where, you know, you turn in your weights or all this stuff, you know, via an app or online or something like that. And th- th- there are positives to that. There are negatives to that, all that stuff. And that's going to depend on your personal experiences with those things. If every time you've done that, and I mean, we've been turning, we've been in Texas at majors for several years now, we have our card, we go up there, we punch in our validation number, our entry number, what we're going to turn our weight in, what our breed is, all this stuff. It prints out this little card, you check it and you go on and stuff like that. And so if you've never had an issue with any of that, then you're probably all great with it. Again, going back to things like in terms of when there is not a process where that animal manually or physically goes through a checkpoint, then again, we're opening it back up to need probably less rules because there's less that you can enforce. And so those are the things these shows are going to have to weigh. Absolutely. And let's, let's, let's kind of, as we're, we're winding up in our main topic here, Ryan, I'm, you and I are going to be called guilty of this. I'm going to bring another show out that I want to use it as, as an example. And I don't want this to be taken anything other than here's an example. Ryan, what is one of the more user-friendly national shows prior to COVID? I, I know lots of them. There's several. There's several that are user-friendly. But there's one, I guess I, maybe I should reword that. There's, there's one of the, the national shows out there that doesn't have an overwhelming sale, doesn't have, didn't have, I guess, in the, initially maybe the, the nicest facilities or anything but their numbers have increased dramatically over the past few years for one reason. And I'm talking oh. about the Arizona national. Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. No, no, when you say that, I was like, I know lots of user friendly. But and, and so, no. I mean, do you, do you think they're, the exhibitors are going there because it's a huge payout if you win? Absolutely not. No, but they're, do you think they're going there because it's the, the nicest facility and it's, it, I mean, it's actually become overcrowded and it's getting difficult from a space standpoint, but, it was a pretty user-friendly show. Maybe you can talk about sometimes the weather's nice and it's a nice vacation yeah, show Yeah, it was not nice when I judged this year's show, though. No, I'm just going to tell you. It hasn't been for a couple of years, and, and we always compliment Arizona, and I'm not, not trying to single that out. I think well, the Well, I will great. tell I you why I will compliment Lots Arizona. Of- Arizona's the only major show that's ever asked me to judge, so yeah, I'm going to pat them <laughs> so on the can. back and compliment you don't, them. You don't mind at all. Yeah, I'm, I'll be real honest. I'm biased. Go Arizona Nationals. But before I ever judged there, and in the last 10 to 5 years, what has made that show grow, and that's before I ever judged there, is because, and not that I went, I've been, I've shown at Arizona National, I've helped kids show at Arizona National, but in the last 10 to 5 years, specifically the last 5, they have made that an environment that not only is user-friendly, but it is also everyone there, whether they are on staff, a volunteer, an intern, whatever, they are in it to make those families have the most enjoyable experience possible. And I, I can't say that about any other show. I'm just being honest. Well, I think that, I think that the, the- the effort there is is has been phenomenal. I think other shows have that in mind, but we no. Maybe they, I'm, have... I think all shows want everyone to enjoy that show and have a good time. Don't get me wrong. The Arizona National goes way, way above and beyond to secure that. And I, I can just give one example. The last two years, they've had at least two interns in every show ring. Taking pictures, they've had backdrop pictures, and they have all been, every single one of them, free to any exhibitor. All you got to do is download it. Tell yeah, me another show I, that does that. None. I can, I can give you another, another example. Uh, just a few years ago, maybe three years ago, to, I don't know how long ago, we showed there 
the lambs and the goats were shown in a sand show ring that was pretty soft, pretty loose, pretty difficult for the stock to get around or for the judge to truly evaluate soundness and movement. And probably, I mean, I've judged in sand rings before, and I'm sure Ryan has. It's even hard for the judge to get around all day long. I made uh, one. Speak for yourself, there, pork chop. <laughs> I made one recommendation to them that that that's maybe not this. It, it's fine, but we could do it better if we had a different surface other than than real loose sand. And immediately that next year, they changed it. And I mean, just the openness to listen to the exhibitors is great. And I, and I think it's I think we have that in other shows, but maybe some of those other shows that have been fairly large have had the luxury that people are going to go to them and we haven't had to accommodate quite to that extreme where Arizona's numbers just a few years ago weren't that high and they were doing everything they can to continue to build numbers and make it as friendly as they can. And it's worked out great. And and that doesn't take anything away from the North American, from American Royal, from Denver, from any of the national shows. I don't want to leave anybody out, but I, I did want to point out that here's one of the, the things as we move forward, and there's going to be more and more competition, exhibitors can choose which ones are listening to them, which ones are making it more accommodating, and they're going to. That is that is their new way to vote, whether they go to the partake in those shows or not, because we're going to have more and more of them, and the more shows, the better. I'm all in. And a lot of this is going to be each individual kid or family. If you have to make a choice. It is which one of those events did you have a more pleasurable, unique, and joyous experience at? And it's not just, and that, a lot of people just think, well, that's whether they won or lost. And I'm telling you, that's not it. I I promise you that's not it. Because there's going to be far fewer winners at every show than there are other people that did not win. And so... When they're making those decisions, it's about everything that encompasses from the time they get on the grounds till the time they leave. From that person that tells them where to park, if that's one of the things. Just yeah, every absolutely. interaction. Every yeah. every level of interaction. And I, I mean to, I want I want to throw out to the American Royal, um, those people there this year, extremely, extremely friendly. Those that are checking our health papers at, at most of these shows, whether it's Oklahoma City, the Royal, Louis, I mean, I think they've all stepped their game up. And, and wow, there, there's somebody at upper level management at these national shows that, that's putting their finger on things and saying, guys, this needs to be user friendly. And I think we're going to continue to get better. I am going to go out on a limb. I have not seen that at the state fair levels. I still see tradition. I'm the boss. This is how it's going to be. That's how it's always been. We're not changing. That crap needs to change because guess what? There's going to be another show or another expo pop up, and that state fair is going to lose numbers to the point where it will not have a livestock show. This is what we're talking about. I mean, and some of these shows that pop up are going to be wildly successful and they're going to stay and they're going to be there. And it is, and I, I don't like to think of it so much as, and there are going to be times where you have to pick one. But like when you're talking about the state fair level, if you had a great expo in your state and your state fair comes back, I think it would be really wise for the people that put on that very successful expo to make it to where the kids could do both. Whether that would be ideal before the right before the state fair or right after the state fair, and sometimes that may not happen. But I, I would like to think that. We have more options, and we wouldn't have to make as many choices. But, like, I, I'm telling you, next January, if all of these shows hold and come back, there, there's going to be no way that you can do Denver, Fort Worth, Cattlemen's Congress if this, you know, 1,150-head junior heifer show comes back again. There's just not enough days. So you will have to make a choice. That's part of it. But again, I think things that those shows are going to have to focus on are unique ways to let those exhibitors and families know we're here, we're listening, and we want you to be involved and we want you to have a great time. And 
one of these things, again, I touched on this last week. Slogan that the customers always write that's been around for like centuries. <laughs> and I, again, I think that we are an industry that doesn't always follow through with that because the customer are the kids and the exhibitors. And up until this point, they've had very little say in anything. I think that they're going to need to have more say. And, and I'm talking more than filling out a survey of this is what I think you did well, this is what I think you need to improve on. You're going to have to implement some of those things. And again, being transparent, show the results of those survey. At this show, everyone thought we did this really well, and so we appreciate your compliments on that, and we're going to continue to strive to do that. The biggest negative that we had was this. And so what we're going to try to do to make that more positive for you is... Those would be things that would show that these shows are working towards keeping what's unique and good about that show going and increasing it. And what isn't so good about it, we're trying to fix it. And then again, I'm going to say, and nobody, they're going to get tired of me saying this, and I really don't care. I think that the exhibitors need to have a say in who judges those shows. Hopefully everybody understands where Ryan and I are coming from, and we're very, very passionate about about this topic. And I think by default, because of COVID, we're in a situation where we're on a faster track to please the exhibitor and giving the exhibitor more choice because the shows simply that that do not accommodate exhibitors, they're no longer going to exist. And and that's as simple as I can put it. I've talked about this on this podcast on Another podcast, I've talked about this, whatever. I I have run shows. I have done it. I know that you want qualified, competent sorters that you feel comfortable with. That is great. Put together a list of three or five. Put them up there and let those kids vote. Let those families vote. And, I mean... There are ways to do it real simply. They don't, if you do that and whoever was selected doesn't do a great job, the next time they're not going to vote for that person. So it is going to, there is no downside in this. You still get to decide the people that could possibly sort your show. The exhibitors get a say in it and it is going to hold that person that is selected even more accountable. Because the people that he or she is about to sort is who got him that position. Don't think that's not going to be on that person's mind when they're standing out in the middle of the ring under the bright lights making the big decisions. Because if you don't think that's true, you're living in a tree. Now, Biden said you can't use he or she. Okay. Whoever it is out there in the middle <laughs> of the is, ring. It is better than he or she. Is that and what for you the record, to say? Ryan, you are a he, correct? I'm telling you, I'm a man. That's just all there is to it. That's it. Born that way. No, (laughs) how it is. I don't want to be a girl. I like to wear makeup. I like to do some stuff. I like to dress crazy. But yeah, I'm well aware I'm a guy. Okay. As we conclude our main topic, I want to make sure that all the show officials, our listeners, hopefully you understand, and, and Ryan and I are trying to be transparent. I don't want to be taken, any of this to be taken negative, but real, that this is a good thing. We're, we're moving forward with more shows. I think it's a positive for our industry. I think the choice is a good thing. Do I feel bad that some shows are going to step it up to compete? Maybe, but you feel at the bad? same time. And I shouldn't say feel bad. I, I feel for some of those shows that have a long tradition and have been around for a very long time, whether it be state fairs, national shows, even even maybe a longstanding jackpot, but more so the the history of some of the state fairs and national shows that they simply need to to understand changes have to be made to accommodate the exhibitors better. That's life, though. Yeah, if those changes aren't made, If you don't change or evolve, you die. And up until COVID, there was no changing or evolving. There was none in some of these. Zero. But this is a good thing. But that shouldn't have been that way. But I'm just saying, and I don't want any show if they had to cancel because of Rona. Or whatever, and didn't get to have one. 
either last summer, this fall, this winter, whatever. I want them all to be back. They're going to have to step it up if they want to keep where they were when they had to cancel. And yes, that's just the reality of it. And anybody that doesn't think that no matter what industry you are in, that you don't have to change and evolve with the times, then you're like an ostrich and you've got your head stuck in the sand because that's how it is. Ryan and I are not trying to to throw darts at show officials or committees. There's a lot of work and effort that that goes into that. And most people working at these events, whether it's their full-time or part-time job or volunteering, they're doing it for the right reasons. And we appreciate all of the time that you're putting into that. We're not being critical on any individual or any show, just stating facts that things are changing. We need to change. We need to evolve. We need to accommodate. Other Ryan, than is- being a show judge, and probably even more so, the most thankless job in the livestock industry is being a show manager or a volunteer at a show. Because you hear all of the bitching, all of the complaints, and you don't hear any of the praise or thank yous. I get no. that part of it. And, and so- right now, we, we thank you for doing it because it without it, we don't exist. Absolutely. That simple. So thank you, all those shows out there for doing what you do, putting on the shows. It's it's it is thankless. It's it's a it's a job that not many are willing to do, and and we do appreciate it. And and I hope you don't. Nobody uh, hopefully takes these comments in, in a negative manner. Ryan, it is time for your favorite section. They won't take your comments negatively. They will just take mine, which is fine. Yeah, that works. I'm I'm good with that. I'm, there you I'm perfectly go. fine with that. Today, brought to you from Popejoy Livestock Transportation, is question and answer. From Tanya, the Dorper sheep are fairly new to the market lamb shows. As more majors add Dorpers to their shows, what is your opinion on the breed and what do you think the future holds for the breed in the market lamb industry? Okay, first of all, I really like Dorpers. I think they're really unique looking animals and so I like them a whole lot. Uh, We've had them in Texas for quite a few years now, and they're becoming popular. But, and again, let's, I, I'm being funny and sarcastic. I think Dale should answer this question because basically a dorper is a goat without a tail. <laughs> <laughs> I got this one. I have got this one. Now, the, the next couple are going to be all yours, though, if I, if I had to dive into this one. Oh, great. Okay. So the dorpers, I, I'm impressed. They've had a strong introduction. Uh, their presence thus far has been really, really well accepted. I think it's simple, Ryan. The show families are going to migrate to quality livestock. If the Dorper breeders can continue to raise quality stock, the popularity will continue to grow. Look at at the swine industry when it was not popular to show an off-breed barrel. How popular is it now, Ryan? Well, that's because I used to bark. So that's why they're (laughs) popular. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Why did you you use a bird? Because it was the best one there. That's it's why. simple. It's simple. Families are going to migrate and purchase and put in their barns quality livestock, irregardless of the species or that breed within that species. So with when people would come to me and say, hey, can you find my kid a steer or heifer or whatever? You know, after we talked about, you know, what my deal was and stuff like that. And then like, get a, before I even asked about price range, I'm going to say, the best thing that you could say is, I don't care what breed it is. I just want the best one you can find me for this number of dollars. And then they would tell me what they had to spend. Because I'm going to be real honest. Those banners are the same in every single breed. They look the same. They say the same thing other than that little breed name on there. Even, They're even the same Houston, thing. Houston trophies are the same. They're the same. They're all and, the and did same. I, did I tell you, I, I need to purchase one of those from you for my wife's Christmas. Yes, Christmas. I know. She's very, she wants a Houston trophy bag. But <laughs> and there is a problem with us living in Illinois and getting a Houston trophy. Those banners and those trophies and those buckles, they're all the same, regardless of the breed. And there's only going to be two big banners handed out at the end of the day. Sometimes there's a top five. But most shows, there's only two big banners. Go into one of those breeds and be competitive. And right now, Dorper is that new one that, I mean, yeah, the competition is stiff here in Texas. I don't know about everywhere, but it's still not as stiff as the medium wolves or the fine wool crosses or the south downs. 
But yeah, so I think they're, they're going to be very still, successful. I mean, they're still in the infancy, and I think they've got a crazy good start on things. I can use myself as an example. I, I, I purchased a herd of goats before they were popular outside of the – showing goats was popular outside of the state of Texas. Yes, you did. You simply take you, – you take the ball off their tail. You fit them like a calf. You put a show, show halter on them and breed them to look like quality livestock. Guess what happens? You have Hummel show goats. Well, not, not my show goats, but in general, they became very, very popular. And the only reason they became popular is because people They didn't look like a goat anymore. Yeah, they, they no longer look like a goat. They look like other livestock. They look like quality livestock. And, and show families are drawn to quality. I don't care if it's a Dorper, if it's a show goat, if it's a Berkshire hog, a Tamworth hog. Uh, Herford piggies. I like yeah, whatever, the Herford Whatever piggies. it may be, as long as breeders put out good ones, show families are going to migrate to them. So back to answering your question, Tanya. Absolutely. I think there's a strong push uh, in the Dorper side of things. I think breeders are putting out better sheep every year. I think the future is very bright for them. Next question comes from Josh. After listening to your County Fair episode regarding the release of judges' names, do you think if judges started releasing their schedules, it would push show committees to release all the names and create a more transparent selection process? Ryan, that's you. I'm not saying that they can't, but uh, again, there, there, there's a couple of things with this. So when you get one of those shows that they say you can't, like norm, you can't tell anybody you're judging the show, that's in the contract. It says that, that you're not allowed to tell anybody you're judging the show. So <laughs> if that's the case and you put on social media or wherever, oh, I'm judging the XYZ show and it's in your contract that you're not supposed to tell anybody, technically they can void your contract and you don't judge the show anyway. That would be a problem. That's number one. Because every show that I've ever had to judge that they told me that I couldn't tell anybody, that's stated boldly in that contract. So that's the first problem there. Secondly, I don't make it any secret when I'm judging a show, I don't think I don't think a lot of people do. If you're allowed to tell, I mean, flyers go out on Facebook. People that are judging those shows share them, stuff like that. I mean, when I'm traveling, I put where I'm going, stuff like that. So, I mean, that part is there. I, I think the biggest thing with this whole not telling the judge, and when we were all locked down and in quarantine, I talked about this on my Facebook lives. My issue is when that they don't announce the judges that somebody knows. And the reason I know somebody knows is because there has not been one of those shows that I was sworn to secrecy. It was in the contract. You can't tell anybody that somebody didn't text, call, send a smoke signal, whatever, and say, hey, are you judging X, Y, Z when nobody's supposed to know? So... It's one of those things, the only person that can keep a secret is between that person and a dead person or whatever. Two people can't keep a secret. Well, somebody's going to tell somebody who's going to tell somebody. And so I, I, that's just, I know, because it's happened every time. And I said on that Facebook Live, if somebody directly asks me, are you judging this show? I am not going to lie to that person. If they, you know, they're going to have to flat out say, are you judging the Dale Hummel goat fraternity, whatever, da, 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 da. And if I am, I'm not going to lie to that person because I don't, I don't like lying to people. I think it's stupid, especially over something that minuscule. So that's my problem with not announcing is because somebody knows and then somebody else knows and somebody else knows. So if a handful of people know, why can't we just let everybody know? And this this comes back to the fact that obviously we, we're going to strongly encourage them to release the judges' names as soon as possible and get those judges hired as soon as possible. But it, it's like some of the rules that we, we we talk about. Some are following the rules and some are not. When some people find out the judge and others do not find out the judge, it becomes a little sketchy. And it all starts with the fact that they do not want to release that judge's name. There is no logical justification for that, period. 
So all Zero. of those out there, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. Every show official or committee, whoever you are, let's just eliminate this. Done. It's done as of today, Ryan. What do you think? Well, I don't think that's going to happen, but I do. Oh, they'll listen. They are going to listen. But I really do think that of all <laughs> the rules that I have or things that shows have do, I really do think that's the most ignorant of all of them. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, and it's It's difficult for me to comprehend. When... When you've grown up and lived in this industry and understand it from every angle, there's no logical explanation. I understand that they think there is, but there is not. Nope. The next question, I'm going to paraphrase because it's fairly long. And I got hate mail over that, by the way. Good. You're going to get a little more. I, yeah, I got hate mail from some anonymous person that's a county agent and state that I'm not going to talk about, and they wouldn't even sign their name to it, that I was ruining the livestock industry because... The only thing that keeps integrity at some of these county fairs was by not announcing the judge's name. <laughs> Ryan, I didn't get that mail. No, again, because nobody. Maybe, maybe I just didn't open it. I, I don't nope, know. No, nope, it was it was no. <laughs> directly to me, sir. <laughs> I appreciate the fact they did that and, and left me out of that. Yeah. Okay, the next one is paraphrased. Basically, and I'm not going to put the person's name in there. I don't want to incriminate him, but we have a listener that talks about their state fair limiting kids to one animal, period. They did this during COVID, and understandably so, to try to limit how many people come and, and all all those things. I don't know really how animal numbers, if one exhibitor brings two, that doesn't necessarily increase the exhibitor number. But anyway, they did it during COVID. No, no issues. We're going to do whatever we can. We're happy that they're having shows during COVID. Their concern is prior to COVID, they know that they were pushing this, and, and this listener feels they use COVID kind of as an excuse. Now, going into the state fair this year, they did implement that rule. This person did have many families text and try to communicate with the fair board that please reconsider. They did not. Right now, they're in a situation where they're only taking one animal. They talk about there's plenty of room at the fairgrounds. For more animals, uh, even a few years ago, they opened it up to bring two steers because they're, they're, the steer numbers were dropping. So it appears to be a situation unlike the Texas shows, Ryan, where you are very crowded on space and you have so many exhibitors trying to go. I'm going to say, we only get to take one period. So but, this is something that like, I've been used to. Every, every Texas major and or state fair, I get it because when you're there, there, there is no more room. It is limit, not because they don't want exhibitors to bring more. They simply cannot facilitate more outside of the state of texas there are very few shows that they couldn't facilitate more animals i'm not saying we need six sheep and six goats per exhibit or anything like that but let's let's keep the numbers if possible more than one because there are families that that would like to take more than one that have more than one on feed maybe more than one species and and i think allowing every opportunity for that is is a good thing but this person's very concerned now that that's put in place. Where do they go? How do they get it changed? How do they? How does their voice be heard? I'm going to throw this to Ryan, but before so, think about it this way. I, I'm not sure if there's another show competing in that state against this one. I suspect there isn't. If they they feel obligated, they have to attend that one. But that goes back to what we talked about. Probably there isn't because obviously he's. This person says that they had a state fair last year. Yes. And that they limited it because of that. So if they had a state fair last year, there was no reason to have a competing show. But I can see both sides of this, to be honest. Uh, I don't know exactly when this person's state fair is, or and it, and it really doesn't matter, because you still have an opportunity to show. When so many people didn't, Last year and may not again this time because we don't know what our president or the states are going to do. Because, again, like I said earlier, Ohio just now locked down indefinitely with no you know future end date in sight. So you need to be grateful that you have a state fair that is allowing your kids to participate and still doing the things that it can to ensure that that happens. I get you wanting to take more. And if the fairgrounds has room and all this other stuff, then you have every right to want that. I don't know exactly what all you've done, but the things that I'm going to tell you, and it sounds like you did some of this, get as many people as possible to submit emails or call up 
whoever's in charge. And again, don't be hostile. Just be rational in your thinking or your conversation or your email with them. State your case on why you think that it needs to be back to the way it was or, you know, or that it needs to be increased. And again, it's going to take a effort of more than just a few because the more people that have the same problem with the show, the more pressure it is on them to change it. I'm going to be real honest with you. You're probably not going to get anything done this year because they can still fall back on the thing that, you know, COVID is there and all this other stuff. But if you put enough pressure on this year and you keep that pressure up and while you're at that state fair, you go seek out every single person that's on that committee or on that state fair board with a group or make them all go and do the same thing. The more times they hear it, they're going to have to listen to it. Not saying that they're going to change it, but the, I promise you, the more times they hear it and are confronted with it, the more likely it is because it is human nature not to want to hear the same complaints over and over and over again. Well, that, that seems simple, right? I, I, I don't know if it's simple, but that's just what I think. Well, thank you again, and, and hopefully the listeners uh, understand where Ryan and I are coming from, especially with our main topic today, because I know it, it does touch some people personally, and it is certainly not meant to be negative by any means, but just open everybody's eyes to transparency is good, choice is good, and as exhibitors, moving forward, you're going to have more of a vote. Ryan, thank you very much. I just want to let y'all know that Dale was the first one that started calling the individual shows out, so send him hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Until next week, be safe. Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>